Uh, right now, I would like to introduce to you, two years ago, on Joko Koo's Crazy uh, One, I was very um, delighted to learn that a good friend of mine from Minneapolis, who I'd performed and written with a bunch of times, was coming on the cruise. And we decided to try something together, and uh, we did a little weirdo comedy, sort of theater, sort of phony lecture piece. Thank you. Uh, called My Monster, and um, it was a real lot of fun, and, and he's come back on, uh, he came back on the second cruise, and he's here again. I would like to introduce you to my good pal, Joseph Scrimshaw! Uh, some direction. Thank you, Bill. I have no hands, so I'm going to hug you. Aww. I got a little Bill Corbett kind of, sweat on Kind of splashy, nose. sorry. <laughs> it's Enjoy. wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Bill Corbett, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do tonight is just a light little comedy show about every single flaw I have as a human being. Thank you, thank you. I think it's, I think it's good for us to talk about our flaws and, and try to find the joy in them and share them in safe spaces like a therapist's office or giant stage on a cruise ship. <laughs> and just to get us all in the mood to share, uh, I would like you guys to think for a few seconds, and when I count to three, I would like everyone to shout out a flaw of their own. Erectile dysfunction! It, erectile dysfunction, you shouted quite quickly, sir. <laughs> Long before I even counted one, two, three. You did not even get your metaphorical pants off, sir. <laughs> So, you, you guys think for just a second, if you can't think of anything, try indecision or egomania. So, I'm going to assume, for some reason, that you sea monkeys are ready to yell. One, two, three. there'd be a funny dribble one. <laughs> but I didn't actually hear it. What was it? Delayed reactions. Oh, legit about hard. Oh, delayed reactions indeed. Oh, I get it. <laughs> well, thank you guys. That, it's really, it is, it's sometimes hard to share your flaws. Not for you guys. Um, uh, but, it, is, it can be actually hard to share your flaws, so what I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a reward. Every time I finish telling you about a flaw, I'm going to come over here and I will get a sip of my stage beer, which is actual beer. Uh, my goal tonight is to share every single flaw I have as a human being, but one of my flaws is having a hard time finishing things, so that probably won't happen. That's how the sipping will work. Um, I actually had a very hard time writing this show because writing is hard. I did not want to start doing it, and I have a little trick for that. When, when I'm having a hard time starting writing, I just start writing about whatever is distracting me at that time. And when I was starting this show, I was horribly distracted by playing a video game. <laughs> a round of applause for video games, indeed. Uh, so I was playing a particular video game where I could experience some escapism, where I could be someone other than myself, someone cool and deadly and efficient. And of course, I'm talking about Luigi from Super Mario Kart. Thank you for the Luigi applause. Let's me know who's who in the crowd. But I am lying to you. Uh, I was not playing as Luigi. I was actually playing a James Bond video game. In particular, I was playing the new GoldenEye for Xbox. Excellent. And it is a slick, brutal, violent video game. And they actually got Daniel Craig to do the voiceover, which is great, because you can sense the shame in every line he speaks. <laughs> it is so odd to be listening to this incredibly intense, talented actor trying to pour emotions into lines like, What's that? I should go over there. I'm on a train. 
She literally says, Daniel Craig himself also recorded a huge series of grunts and groans for every time he gets shot. And if you're not particularly good at the game, which I'm not particularly good at the game, James Bond gets shot a lot. So you get to hear Daniel Craig say things like, Hey, come on, knock it off, you got your dicks. He doesn't actually say that, but that is very clearly his subtext. There are also helpful hints in the video game when you finish one scene and the next one's loading, and these helpful hints are incredibly insulting because they are not only things that are obvious within the world of the game, they are things that are obvious in the real world. Hints like, grenades are dangerous. If one lands near you, run away. Most cars have gas tanks. If you shoot them, they might explode. In one of the ones... <laughs> Shadow Show. And one of the ones that I hate the most is, if you get lost, check your smartphone. That really makes me feel like I'm James Bond. Quickly, Bond, you must find the nearest Chipotle. The world depends on it. But the one I actually hate the most is the hint it gives you to teach you to silently move about and kill people. And that hint is this. No one can hear you when you crouch. I have put up with a lot of ridiculous bullshit from video games. But no one can hear you when you crouch is too far. I would argue that one of the loudest sounds in the world is a middle-aged man bending over. You have all the pops and the cracks from the joints, and it's, it's actually a terrifying sound to hear from the other rooms. Is that a thunderstorm? Is popcorn being made? No, Dad dropped his keys. But more than that is the sigh. It is impossible for middle-aged men to bend over without sighing. And it is a very specific sigh. Something along the lines of, <sighs> it is a sigh that says so much. It says, ah, I resent gravity. Ah, whatever's down there better be worth it. But even more than that, it carries with it the weight of every poor choice that man has ever made. Oh, I ordered the Hobbit meal at Denny's. Oh, I bought a Zoom. Oh, I have a liberal arts degree. Sad but true. So, once you silently crouch, your next goal is to sneak up on a dude and, and take him out. Uh, and it is one thing, you know, to crouch, but a crouch with movement is called a duck walk. <laughs> so you usually have to move about 20 feet down a hallway, duck walking as James Bond. And I like to picture it in context of the famous opening scenes of James Bond movies. You know, there's the white gun barrel logo, and in most movies, James Bond strides in full of confidence and a world suddenly and shoots. This video game's opening sequence would probably be more along this. And then James Bond would turn the wrong way, turn the wrong way again, pull out his smartphone. Where the fuck am I? So after you endure the shame of doing that, it's James Bond, you can finally kill someone, and you, you depress a button, and what's supposed to happen is James Bond kicks the legs out of a guard, he catches them and covers their mouth, and then with his other hand, karate chops their throat and crushes their windpipe, which is really cool. And that is what's supposed to happen. 
but more often than not, my game at least glitches, and James Bond performs the attack that he does when you're running around, which is that his hand lashes out and he hits you with the butt of his gun, which is great when you're standing. <laughs> but when you are crouching behind a man, you hit him in the ass. And you hit him in the ass so hard, he dies. <laughs> and because the game is glitching, he does not die silently. He says something along the lines of, ah! <laughs> Like the Wilhelm scream, but less elegant. He might as well just narrate what has happened to him. Ah! Jake Bond duck walked up behind me and killed me in the ass! Ah! I don't have a will! Ah! I regret the life choices that led me to this! Ah! And while this is happening, another guard is standing right next to him who does not acknowledge any of this. I think he sees it and hears it, and just, just out of common decency, he doesn't comment. Did that really happen? Did the most famous spy in the world just kill you in the ass? Is that actually the final note in the symphony of your life? Jesus! <laughs> so obviously I've played this game a little bit, uh, to think about it this much. And I was playing along, and as all of you who play Xbox know, every once in a while you get this ding and you get uh, achievement unlocked. It's a little award that keeps making you want to play. And I was playing and I, I got a little ding. And I got an achievement unlocked. And the achievement was for killing 100 men from behind. <laughs> so I asked myself, uh, wh wh why are you playing this game? Is it, is it for fun? Is it for escapism? Are you really so desperate to avoid writing that you would rather spend hours of your short life killing men in the ass? <laughs> So I put the controller down, I went into my office, and I wrote this bit. Thank you. And now I know that the next time I bend over, the weight of my sigh will be a little less, because I wrote about ass-killing for you. was one of the most difficult flaws for me to admit, and that is the flaw of being stubborn. <laughs> Black power for stubbornness. <laughs> uh, so, but sometimes, even when you're stubborn, reality just has a way of getting right up in your face and you have no choice but to accept it. A couple of years ago, I was leaving the house, I was going to go do a gig and make some money, and my lovely wife, Sarah, stopped me, and she said, Remember to listen to your wife head. And when Sarah says wife head, she means I should imagine that there is a tiny fairy-like version of her perched on my shoulder who says helpful things like, has it ever really worked out well for anyone to switch from drinking beer to tequila at 1.30 a.m.? And when Sarah first brought up the concept of wife head, I asked her if it was like an angel and a devil thing, and she said, no. Wife head doesn't judge. She just wants you to be safe. So on this particular day when Sarah said, remember to listen to your wife head, and I said, yes, of course I will, I was lying. Later that day, I would do something incredibly dangerous and totally stupid for basically no reason. 
A friend of mine had asked me to act in some commercials, and the commercials were for a company that sold replacement parts for photocopiers. And my co-stars in this commercial would be a few friends, a photocopier, a cougar, and a bear. I do not mean cougar and bear in any of their current cultural contexts. I mean the actual animals, a cougar and a bear. My friend had located some guy in the woods who claimed to be a professional in handsome animals who he claimed were trained actors. These animals were trained actors in that they did not immediately kill us on sight. They only considered it just like real actors do. <laughs> so we get there and our first shot calls for a cougar to chase me. You know, to advertise replacement parts for a photocopier. Of course, the cougar couldn't actually chase me because the cougar would catch me. So we got a shot of me running and then we set up a shot where we needed the cougar to run. So the professional guy in the woods released the cougar from her leash and he went about 30 feet away, and he started dancing around and sort of teasing the cougar like it was a small house cat to get the cougar to run. And the cougar just stared at him, looked the other way, and pounced! And this was the reaction of the professional guy, the man entrusted with our safety. Oh, son of a bitch! And then he dove behind a tree. <laughs> so now we, we survived the cougar. We moved on to shooting with the fully grown black bear. And if this black bear was a professional actor, she was a very difficult actor with a great union because she took a break whenever the fuck she wanted. <laughs> the only means of control the professional guy in the woods had over the bear was to feed her treats. Specifically, gummy bears. <laughs> Little sugar-filled gelatin images of herself. And shot after shot, the bear would not look or stand where he wanted, but he just kept rewarding this negative behavior with more and more gummy bears, and it was maddening. Eight hours later, we set up the final shot, which was me playing chess with a bear. You know, to advertise replacement parts for a photocopier. <laughs> Thank you. This bear did not want to play chess with me, so the gummy bears kept being put closer and closer and closer to me. First they were on the bench, then they were on the table, then they were on the chess set, then they were in my hand. The bear would not look at me, and professional guy was getting frustrated, and he said, fine, here's how we're going to do it. You just put the gummy bear between your teeth. <laughs> and the bear will look at you. And at this point, I just wanted to go home, so I said, fine. And I stuck the gummy bear between my teeth, and the bear leaned its big bear head in and nibbled it out. <laughs> and I could feel her bare teeth scratching my lip. We do this two more times. <laughs> with the exact same result, of course. And I asked my friend, the director, did we get the shot? And he said, no. <laughs> we need a shot of a bear looking at you, and what we have is a shot of a bear eating out of your mouth. <laughs> it's good footage. It's really good footage. <laughs> but let's try it one more time. So I put the gummy bear between my teeth, and the bear started to come in close. And for some reason, in that moment, I decided the bear does not deserve this treat. I've been working hard all day and I haven't had a single goddamn gummy bear. This one is mine. So I pulled the gummy bear away from my teeth and deep back into my throat. And the bear leaned in and she pressed her mouth against mine. And then she jammed her tongue into my mouth. And she began to fish around, looking for it. That was
which point, wife had appeared on my shoulder. And she said, I'm not judging. I'm just wondering, why are you French kissing a bear? So I released the gummy bear, and the bear ate it, and fucked off into the woods. She did not buy me a drink. She did not compliment me on my technique. She just left. So we wrapped up a uh, shooting, and we went home, and I decided, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna tell Sarah what happened. So I, I told Sarah what happened, and she said, what were you thinking? The bear could have chewed your face off. And I said, yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. I just felt really strongly in that moment that the bear had not earned that treat. And this incident forced me to accept that I'm perhaps a little bit more stubborn than I thought. And it's also set a new low bar for poor decision making. So when I'm out in the world doing something stupid for no reason, not only do I hear wife head, but I hear her sighing and saying, well, at least it's not as stupid as making out with a bear. <laughs> My next one's kind of different. Um, I'm a very obsessive person, so once I start liking something, I have a hard time stopping liking it. And one of the things I like to do as a performer is audience interaction. I do it in almost every live show, and I just kind of can't stop myself. Even if I don't really have a plan, there's not a reason to do it. And even if all I'm going to do is just approach one person and ask them questions, I can't stop myself. <laughs> Hello. What's your name? Eric. Eric. Do you have flaws? Yes. Well, can you say one? Procrastination. Procrastination? Or procrastination? Pro so you put things off? You answered very quickly, which is great. <laughs> I'm very impressed. You thought of it earlier. You thought of it ahead of time? When we made eye contact? Oh, so you yelled procrastination? I just assumed everyone yelled something smart at us. <laughs> so, Eric, I, I have an important question for you. If you could travel back in time and punch any historical figure other than Hitler, <laughs> who would you punch? Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, that asshole. And Eric, do you like tacos? Yes. Would you be willing to give me a hug right now? Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That was a nice short one. <laughs> Another one of my flaws is that I am very, very oversensitive. Uh, someone once called me a Hufflepuff, and it legitimately hurt my feelings. Real Hufflepuffs would be too shy to yell their names. I'm also a werewolf. Uh, but instead of turning into a wolf during full moons, I become an asshole at random times. Damn, Pufflehuff! Now I'm just making things up so I can take a drink. Sometimes I admit things on stage that I should not. For example, this is entirely true. Out of my own free will, I have watched The Phantom Menace over 20 times. That beer was supposed to last the entire show. 
And this seems like a good time to perhaps talk about my relationship with alcohol. <laughs> I don't know if I really consider uh, drinking alcohol a flaw by any means, but I do, I do feel guilty about it. And I think I feel guilty because at a very young age, I started getting the pressure that it was a bad thing. In high school, I got a driver's ed manual, and it had a little mnemonic device for when you shouldn't drink. And it was the word HALT, H-A-L-T, which meant that you should not drink when you are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I am always at least two of those things at any given time. Many years ago, I, I stopped smoking, and when I stopped smoking, I vowed that I would always keep my drinking under control because I do not want to give drinking up. And over the years, I've kind of wondered, why is drinking so important to me? What do I like about it? I mean, it's the, the taste, the aesthetic, the absurdity, you know, the coping with the phantom menace, all the normal reasons for drinking, but I felt like there was something more. And I've, I've gone on a long search for what that something is. In many of these searches, have occurred on my friend's annual bar crawl. Yeah. By applause, how many people have gone on a bar crawl? Yeah. A bar crawl is an absurd thing, because it's like rising to meet the challenge of a dare that no one has made. <laughs> it is the adult equivalent of a five-year-old running circles in the living room. The first few rounds are fun, then your body clearly tells you to stop, you do not listen, and you end up on the living room carpet with a bad case of the spins and rug burns that are difficult to explain. <laughs> the first several bar crawls I went on, my theory was I should drink beer because it has less alcohol, but it's so heavy. In one year, I actually had 10 beers in six hours, and I thought I might know what it is to be pregnant. <laughs> After this pregnancy scare, I decided to get healthy. And the next year I decided I will only drink screwdrivers. They are light, they're easy to digest, you get all that vitamin C from the orange juice, they're practically a health supplement. So that year we went to 17 bars in 14 hours, and I had a drink at every bar. I had 15 screwdrivers, one beer, and a watermelon shooter. A watermelon shooter is a small cocktail made of sugar, the color red, and hate. The next day, my body decided to go on a cleansing diet. And by cleansing diet, I do mean repeated vomiting. I have never been that dehydrated. It was like a giant space creature made of salt, ate some salt, and then took a crap in my mouth. I knew I needed to rehydrate, so I, I got out of bed and I, I stumbled over to the kitchen and I opened up the refrigerator and I tried to decide what looks good, and I thought, milk. Cool, refreshing milk. So I drank some milk, and I put it back, and I walked to my bed, and I laid down, and I immediately got up, and I continued on to the bathroom where I vomited. And this is what I experienced. Horrible, acrid vomit taste. Cool, refreshing milk. <laughs> so quickly, the milk was still fresh and delicious. <laughs> Quite good. And it was in this moment that I reflected on my use of alcohol, and I learned absolutely nothing. <laughs> Vomiting from alcohol is, of course, horrible, uh, but there are also other problems, uh, mental impairments, for example. Uh, a few years later, on the next bar crawl, on about bar 12, uh, a woman who hadn't been on the bar crawl ran into me, and she's an actor, and another friend of mine had said, hey, can you uh, find out if this person wants to do the show? And the friend I ran into at the bar said to me, could you tell your other friend that I can't act in that show? 
And I am a very, very friendly, very happy inebriate. So I said, that would be great! Awesome! I'd love to do that! And she said, I don't, I don't think you're going to remember. Why don't you write it down? And I said, that's a great idea! You're a great person! So I rummaged around and I wrote something down and I put a note in my pocket and, uh, of course, forgot entirely about it. And a week later, remembering nothing, I found a mysterious note in my pants. A note that simply read, I will tell him. I thought I was a spy in a Kafka novel. <laughs> and then it all came back to me, and it was in that moment that I learned nothing. <laughs> and a couple years after that, uh, Sarah and I got married, and we fell into a nice kind of system, a habit of we would eat, and we would have like one drink with dinner, and we would watch something, and I didn't know a lot about wine, so Sarah was kind of teaching me about wine, and we sampled many fancy, nice wines, and then we decided to drink something from Trader Joe's. I believe it was white. Uh, so we ate some pasta, we drank some white. Uh, I believe that night we watched a couple episodes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and we went to bed. And I woke up suddenly. Sarah was making an odd noise. And her head seemed to be moving against her will. And I had the horrible realization that she was having a seizure. And of course, in the moment, there was nothing funny about it. But in retrospect, I am proud to say I handled it like a true comedian. Because <laughs> here was my thought process. Oh my god, my wife appears to be having a seizure. That's okay. I've seen people have seizures on television, so I know what to do. <laughs> when someone has a seizure on television, the person not having a seizure put something in their mouth. I do not know why. Perhaps to stop choking, perhaps to stop biting the tongue. I don't know. But I knew that I needed to put something in my wife's mouth. So I calmly looked for something. And when I said calmly, I did exactly this. I did an impression of an animated GIF for about 15 seconds and then realized, my hand, I will sacrifice my hand. And I, I kind of made a karate shop sort of thing like this and then I advanced on Sarah. So this is what she saw. Over here for you people. And Sarah, of course, backed away and stared at me like I was insane. And it is a sobering moment when a person in the middle of having a seizure looks at you like you're the one behaving abnormally. So I came to my senses and I called 911 and we went to the hospital and we were there for a couple days and eventually Sarah was diagnosed with a cavernoma. A blood vessel in her brain had leaked just a few drops of blood and had irritated her nervous system. Uh, but they said, we, we need to keep running more tests and we need to figure out what needs to change in your life. Uh, and after we had been there for about two days, Sarah was starting to get kind of loopy, and the nurse brought her some tomato soup, and when she was eating it, uh, some hair from her bun fell out and fell into the tomato soup. And Sarah said, Oh, my hair fell in the toilet sauce. <laughs> and I looked at her, and she hadn't realized what she said, so I said it back, and then I asked if I could put that in a comedy show sometime. <laughs> And she's very understanding, so she said yes. Uh, and we both wondered, though, if, if that was the exhaustion or if that was the cavernoma talking. And a couple hours after that, a very stern doctor that we hadn't actually dealt with that much came in. And she said, okay, here's the deal. Sarah's going to have to take pills every day for the rest of her life. They're probably going to alter her mood or her personality. You cannot conceive children while on these pills. Sarah cannot drive, and Sarah can never again drink alcohol. And throughout this whole ordeal, I had been stoic and manly. But when the doctor said Sarah cannot drink alcohol, I began to weep. I 
didn't blubber, just a few manly tears. As it turned out, they were wasted tears, because it turns out the doctor was full of shit. Like, last season of Lost, full of shit. Sarah can drive, she knows the difference between tomato soup and toilet sauce. She takes pills, but they don't change her personality at all, and she can drink. <laughs> But in that moment of, of weeping over the concept of my wife not being able to have alcohol, that's when I finally learned something. Alcohol had been there in every stage of our relationship. It had been there on our first date, it had been there on our wedding, the first time we watched something on Netflix instant, all of the important moments in a marriage. And I realized that, that alcohol is something I want to be able to share with my wife because it's like an old friend. An old friend with many names and many faces. I believe beer is an old high school buddy named Dave. Wine is an elegant French woman named Juliet. Whiskey is your kind of weird European uncle who posts lewd jokes about sheep on Facebook at 2 a.m. Vermouth is shy. Malort is a hipster. Tequila is an asshole. I could go on, but they are all friends. They are friends who have been with me when I'm hungry, angry, lonely, tired, happy, sad, single, married, and standing on a stage on a giant cruise ship. Oh, thank you, Judy. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to give a toast to my admittedly flawed friend, Mr. Alcohol. So, uh, my, my next last flaw is optimism. And I know a lot of people might think optimism is not a flaw. And to you people, I say Hitler. <laughs> Hitler was an optimist. He knew for a fact it was a bad idea to invade Russia. But Hitler had a my cup is half full attitude toward invading Russia. And he just went for it. It's this kind of attitude, this I'm gonna look on the bright side, even when there pretty clearly isn't one, that has caused me to watch The Phantom Menace again and again. I keep having hope that it will be better, that maybe it's my fault that I can do something in the relationship between me and The Phantom Menace to change this. But it's, it's like a physical DVD that I put in, and it, it does not change, it does not get better. It is basically a two-hour, it-won't-get-better video. <laughs> but I keep trying anyway, and, and I've had this kind of attitude towards optimism where I don't, I get hopeful and then I don't realize where to stop for many, many years. When I was very young and first dating, like 14 years old, just like David, 14 years old, I kept trying to have relationships with young women who were just not, not doing well. They had lots of problems, and, and I thought, oh, maybe I can fix this or that, but they, they were basically like the Phantom Menace. They meant well, but they were just emotionally a mess. <laughs> and uh, there was one woman in particular that I pursued uh, named Molly, and there was just a cycle of rejection, and I would not give up. And I want you guys to know that these stories I've been telling you tonight are true. So I have brought from my actual life some primary documents. So I want to share with you a card that Molly gave me. And it says on the front, Joseph, if you really, really love me, you'll do just one thing for me. And then there's a picture of a sad bunny sitting on a couch pulling its little bunny finger. Inside it says, forgive me. And then it says, in, in Molly's handwriting, I've been having a lot of problems outside of school lately and you are easy to take it out on. I'm sorry. By the way, the scratches were an accident. I only meant to give you a few small marks. Love, Molly. Please pull your pity noises back into your bodies. I do not share with this, this with you for pity. I do not want your pity. I only want you to understand where the next document is coming from. Clearly this card represents, hey, Joseph, let this relationship go. But I did not. I continued to pursue it. And the way I pursued it in particular 
was by telling young women like Molly that I was going to be a singer in a rock and roll band. The only small problem with that is that I cannot sing. I am tone deaf. But for years, I was optimistic that maybe I could sing. But no amount of hope will make you hit the right note. But I persisted, and I wrote these little rock and roll songs that I was going to sing with my band, and I wanted uh, to share them with the other kids at school. And I would like to share one of those with you. And this very optimistic song is very special, uh, because I had also realized when I was 14, when I wrote this, that there were certain words that had sexual connotations. And if I said them, I could get more attention and more laughs. The problem was, I didn't quite understand exactly how they should be used. So this song is sort of like a sexual analogy that makes sense, that you've then put through Google Translate 18 times. <laughs> this funny, sexy song that I was going to sing in my rock and roll band is about a helium balloon. And it is called Mr. Suckface. <laughs> Here are the lyrics. There once was a friendly helium balloon. His head was white and round, like the moon. And if you sucked him, you'd sound like a loon. Oh baby, oh yeah, it's Mr. Suckface. Make me squeak, make me squeal, make me speak just like a seal. Oh baby, oh yeah. I'm your suck face. <laughs> Please pop me with a pin, again and again. Deflate me and blow me back up. Don't ever stop. Tie my string to a pole and take a suck right from my hole. <laughs> oh yeah, oh baby. I'm your suck face. <laughs> when I inhale you in my den, I lose a lot of oxygen. Sometimes I think I'll die, but you're better than anything, even Lucy in the sky. <laughs> oh baby, oh yeah, it's Mr. Suck face. Make me squeak, make me squeal, make me speak just like a seal. Oh baby, oh yeah, I'm your suck face. Never go away, cause you know your place is in my face. <laughs> Float me to the ceiling, it gives me such a good feeling. Just let me know when you need your next blow. Oh yeah, oh baby, I'm your suck face. And then 14-year-old me actually wrote, in parentheses, musical interlude. <laughs> and concluded with the line that is indicated to be spoken, so you can suck me. That is the song that I had hopes would change my romantic life around. I was clearly wrong to be optimistic about that. That song would not improve anyone's romantic life. It would not help Hitler invade Russia. And it only might make the Phantom Menace better. We don't know. Uh, so I, I am, seriously, I get very frustrated with myself for being overly optimistic and trying things after I should clearly stop. But in a way, I am I'm just a little bit happy that I wrote Mr. Suckface because I have gotten some joy from sharing that horrible fucking song with you lovely people. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm running short on time, so I am, I'm going to do my last flaw very quickly. This is a flaw that I think a lot of people uh, struggle with, and that is the flaw of feeling guilty for everything. I feel guilt all the time. So it, I, I don't have time to list everything I feel guilty about. So I'm going to only list the top 75. <laughs> so here we go. Number one, I feel guilty about aging. I feel it is my fault. I feel like there was probably some time where I was presented with a magical button that I could depress 
but I was too busy writing Mr. Suckface or playing Super Mario Brothers, and now I have to die like a mortal. Number two in the list of things I feel guilty about. I feel guilty that this one-man comedy show cannot possibly pass the Bechdel test. Number three, I feel guilty about spending so much time on social media, and at the same time, I actually do feel guilty that I'm not spending enough time on Google+. Plus. <laughs> Number four, I feel guilty about using a list, because I think between BuzzFeed and Cracked, soon all human communication will be done in the form of top ten lists. <laughs> Number five, I feel guilty that I am doing a show for geeks and I have not used the word zombies or utilicals. I am sorry about that. Number six, I now feel guilty for pandering with zombies and utilicals. Number eight, I feel guilty about my tendency to just advance things quickly and skip to the end. So number 75 of the things that I feel guilty about is that I feel guilty about being guilty. Uh, I wanted this show to be a positive thing. We all have flaws, and we have the choice to, to try to change them or embrace them and find some joy in them. And that's what I want to do. That's how I want to end the show, is by, by finding some joy in my flaws. So I'm, I'm going to be stubborn and stupidly optimistic, and I'm going to sing a song for you. Even though I cannot sing. And to help me with this, please welcome Mr. Bill Corbin and Mr. Kevin Murphy. This is a song that I vowed I would never sing. But this cruise has been like this nice support group of all the artists trying new things. So I would like to present to you guys uh, a the first the very, very first live performance, and probably the last, of Mr. Suck. Once there was a he on the room. His head was white and round like the moon. And if you sucked him, You'd sound like a loon. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah, it's Mr. Suckface. Make me squeak, make me squeal, make me squeak just like a seal. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah, I'm your Suckface. Pop me with your pin, do it again. Deflate me and blow me back up again Tie me to a pole To suck from my hole
Scrimshaw, everybody. We're going to take a short 10-15 uh, minute break so we can uh, reset the stage for some uh, Red Hot Riff Tracks action. Please use the facilities as befits your needs. We'll see you in about 10 or 15 minutes.